Benny, did you think you would be this famous and successful when you started your singing career? Are you kidding me? I thought I would be much more famous. Meaning I to, thought. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Meaning to say, if someone's starting, let's say, a business or starting a career in anything, I'm asking you as a you know, famous music person, and they're starting their first day selling, let's say, lemonade or slices of pizza. Lemonade is actually becoming a public traded company. Anyway, what? Oh, right, the insurance. Yeah. All right. The first day you started singing, yeah. I guess your your father's famous, yeah. your uncle's famous, right? Yeah. So you knew that. Did that make it easier for you to believe in yourself that you could also be famous? Like it's it's within reach, or Bichlal now you just started singing and things just evolved. Well, first of all, the goal is not to be famous. Being famous is not a goal. Successful. Be, being successful being effective right you know you, you're trying to accomplish something being famous is not an accomplishment so Most when you famous people have never accomplish nothing yeah. so every time you hit the stage you, you have a goal in mind you want to do I want to uh, make somebody feel something that's the goal what's usually that feeling you're trying to accomplish if it's uh, joy and happiness it's also an accomplishment if it's um, Jewish pride, a little bit of Avas Yisrael, I don't know, whatever it is, there's a lot of, there's a whole, a whole collection of, a whole library of positive feelings that a person could, have, could feel. Try to make somebody feel something. Before you sing, how do you accomplish this agenda before you sing? You're 10 years old and you want to make people happy and you weren't singing. I don't know what I did when I was 10 years old. Let's say 15. I'll tell you when I was when I was stuck in you know, when I was 16. I was in yeshiva in in, in uh, Eretz Yisrael, and there was a guy who came into yeshiva, an older guy, and uh, it was a it was a lively guy, and people thought he was a little cool. And he, we, we, he came into yeshiva in the middle of a fabrengen. I don't know how much time you have. Plenty. And he uh, so they schlepped him to the fabrengen. Anyway, he was right there with them. He was Freilach, and he was. And he started talking, and I got the feeling like, oh, this guy's actually a really a serious dude, like a real, real deal. Anyway, so I, I started to, to talk to him. I started to spend a lot of time with him. Actually, he was singing at his wedding. That was like the first wedding, wedding wedding that I actually sang at. It's Vas. Benjamin Alexander. That's his name. Great, great guy. And one day he told me that uh, I remember I was talking to him. And I said something and I smiled. And he said to me, you have such a great smile. I don't know why you don't smile more often. And, and now here we are, almost 20 years later. And every single day I think about what he said. Whenever I do a message, a, a, a conversation or something, I'm always thinking I, I should smile. Because I have a very great smile and I should smile more often. So you're saying that's how you make people happy before you sing, was smiling, or you should, or that uh, it's a it's a conscious thought to make somebody feel something positive. So when you hit the stage, you want to make people feel happy positive. or yeah, yeah, yeah. proud, whatever it is, something good. I don't want to make people sad. I don't want to make them cry. I don't want to make them feel like they wasted their money. <laughs> I want them to feel something positive. That's it. A little. A little uh... So back to for someone starting their business the first day. The first day you started singing, let's say you were 12 years old, did you say, I want to be a singer? Or it wasn't like, it was sort of like, I don't know, I want to be a rabbi? Like, like no, what was, we're like, we're, did it start somewhere? Or everyone just asked you, oh, please sing, please sing, please, like, and like, you're like, oh, I guess enough well, people no, asked me to more, sing, let's start saying, charging please, money. It was more like people who sing, please shut up. It, it was, was really like that. Yeah, no, because... It wasn't I, an I, easy... Because I wouldn't stop singing. You know what I'm trying to say is, it wasn't a day when I decided, you know what, I think I'm going to become a singer. It was something that I did, something that I do. It's anyway. Not, yeah, it's some, it, it's, I sing. And if I wouldn't be a singer by trade, I would still be singing. Because it's, my, it's in my neshama. So I would say that it, 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 a singer doesn't decide one day, you know, you go to your, uh, what do you call it, a career uh, counselor in, the, in college and decide, should I do this, should I become a lawyer, should I become a singer? It was second nature. It, yeah. Or even first nature. What's funny is I meet different singers, 
because I try to get them to promote my art gallery. And some of them you won't, it doesn't look like singing was like, it didn't, they don't, it didn't seem like it came natural. Like Sean Lemmer, he came, so he's singing the whole time. Yeah. So I felt like he's not doing it because like he wants fame or this. He's just, it's who he is. So Melech Cohen actually said a very interesting thing that when he was, he was waiting tables in some restaurant in Manhattan in his, you know, less affiliated era in his life. Yeah. And he said the lady, the owner told him, please stop singing, just shut your mouth. And what it could cause most people when some person with confidence tells you to shut up, yeah. guess what happens? Right. You never sing. I just went right. to a art gallery in uh, Crown Heights, Bitsala Gallery, competitor. I'm still going to talk about him. Shmuel Paltman is the most prolific, biggest genius in Jewish art in today's world. And I say, Shmuel, you're so artistic. The way you describe paintings, the way you just... He always discovers the best artists. He's not the... I wouldn't call him the Bill Gates of business. He's a real artist. And then he starts telling a story how he once went to a gallery. It's a well-known gallery. They brought in a painting that he painted, and the guy screamed at him and chased him down the block. I said, Shmuel, for that reason, is that why you never painted? Oh, I don't know. He said he totally blew it off. But Tisha Mira Deer, many people in the world have those moments where they could have been the next Benny Friedman or the next Picasso, and people in their lives, whoever they are, for whatever bad reasons they have, they kill people's careers from one line, one comment, one this, one that. So Baruch Hashem, but you said with all your negativity that people told you to shut up, you clearly uh, kept on going. Right. Did you ever say, maybe I should shut up, maybe it's not for me, because people are always telling me to shut up, or it never occurred to you? It, it, never. Never. Why not? You need a times two? Ten. Because, like, uh, this is what I'm trying to say, it's not a choice. It's not a choice. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously it could be if I had it, I would have a really traumatic experience, right? Like, uh, Ellie Schwe will actually, uh, on, on the... On uh, Leif Tar, they sing a song about a guy who always used to sing. You know, he worked in the cleaners, and they always would sing. And then his friends told him, "Go, go to the big city, and uh, you know, enter the contest." And he finally does it. And then, they, you know, the next day in the newspaper, they write about how terrible it was, and he should, he should go find himself another job. It was horrible. And like, and he never sang again, right? Until then, everything was fine. Sad ending. Yeah. Um, so you so couldn't like, help yourself. A traumatic experience that could shut somebody up. Uh, some guy will tell you shut up. I mean, the fact that your uncle was a successful singer did it help you give you confidence that it's within reach? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming so. Absolutely. It's it, it's it's made it made it, you know, something that felt tangible, attainable, reachable, attainable. Not uh, you know somebody that lives in like. Uh, the fact that your father was a famous is a famous speaker, well traveled. Did that also give you the vision of the world as not just St. Paul, Minnesota? That there's a bigger world than... For sure. But also St. Paul, Minnesota probably gave me that same thing. You know, a lot like people say, living out of town. Right? You grew up out of town. Out of town, you realize that the world is a little, a little bit bigger. But... Uh, Do you ever bump into singers and you like wonder why they're not the mix? Benny Friedman, they're so talented. They didn't get the right marketing, the right branding, they didn't have the right platform. you ever see that or... You're usually it's not that amazing. You ever go to Hassan or something and you hear this amazing guy singing but he doesn't have the confidence to take the next level or it's not usually the case? I think I think that you, you usually... Or do talent organically gets recognized and I automatically think so. right. rises? I think that's what happens. And then you, you look at somebody you can say, it could be it didn't happen yet but it's definitely going to happen because this guy is just too good. Who, where would you say you ever saw that and it really happened? Ooh, good one. Uh, Mordechai Shapiro. What was your first interaction with him? My first interaction with him was I uh, I bumped into him outside a restaurant in, in Yerushalayim, and he introduced himself. And I remember him from uh, Miami Boys Choir. And he told me that he's gonna he's working on an album and he's gonna think. And I hear I hear a hundred people say that you know every month. And I said, Good on you, go ahead and do it. And I was I was with somebody when he left. Somebody said, What do you think? And I said, Hey. Everybody's entitled to try, right? And then I did something with him on Chalamoy Pesach, or something like that. And he, whatever, he just fire. He's fire on the stage. And it was... And he's got a, a whole different way of singing than from what we're used to. Now his father drives a bus. Yeah. 
would you say your experience based on, I mean, from a psycho, I don't know what the word is, per se, your father drives a bus and then you decide to take off in a senior group, would you think it's much, it was more difficult for him because he didn't have Avram Frida's uncle and Manas Rimi as a father? Absolutely. You ever discuss that with he, him? And he says it himself that he, 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 he would speak to everybody, he would try to get somebody to help him, and everybody like brushed him off. And, you know, he had nobody in his corner who was like, hey, like, I mean, for me, first of all, I had these giants in my family who were like, you know, they're Have. successful in their, in their, uh, in their chosen uh, fields. Um, but also, like, I have, uh, you know, a name, asso- name recognition association. Avram Fried made some phone calls for me. Like, I mean, of course. You get little, you get boosts. Things. But you're saying but, if someone's talented enough, organically they'll rise to the top anyway. I always think about it, by the way. I think... For sure, there is there is talented people. Like I always think, there's a guy somewhere. Maybe he's here now, who can sing like Mordechai Ben David. He's just he's just too afraid. It's not even a question in my mind that these people exist, and uh, that's it. And they'll never be discovered because uh, it is what it is. I have a very I have an interesting thing that happened recently. I was speaking to a very successful business person. And he's even his he, he, people even know who he is. And when it comes to, and he also paints, but he doesn't. Whatever his confidence level is not, you know, he wasn't raised in the circumstances, the perfect. And I started telling you, you do great art. You should keep on going. Keep, and then he starts. And he never bought a painting from me, but now he keeps on coming back. And I'm like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I'm thinking to myself, you need my encouragement. Look, a super successful businessman in your field, and everyone knows you. Uh, you know, but it's very interesting that people find their success in a very specific way, and it doesn't pass over to a different talent or a different specialty. And only when someone comes in and says, "Whoa, that was great," it's like, "Oh, really? It's great?" And you're thinking, "Why do you? Why do I need to be the one?" You're very, you're clearly very accomplished in your field that you're doing, but it's very interesting. It doesn't even pass over. Did you get encouragement from your parents, or it was just whatever? Let him do his thing, and that's it. I got, I got some encouragement. My parents, I guess... They seem like hands-off people. I that's why I'm right. asking. They, they tried very hard not to push me in any one direction. I think that was very important. But when they when it was clear what direction I was going, they, they went full, full steam behind me. Um, my parents... Uh, told me after I finish uh, smicha, they'll pay for my voice lessons, right? And then when it was a question of who I should go to, my father said, if you're going to do it, you may as well go to the best. And we found, I was in Los Angeles at the time, I was in Calabasas at the time, we found like this great Hollywood voice teacher. And my father was like, that's do you need, to do it. You know, to, do you need a voice teacher in general or it's a little overrated? It was absolutely not overrated. You need you need a voice teacher. I mean, some people can sing great naturally, but if you want any longevity, if you want to be able to sing for a long time on a semi steady basis, you need to know how to use your voice correctly. Not a choice. You know, it has to happen. Could talent be taught, or it's, you have it, or you're not, Benny? Um, I, well, I don't know if talent can be taught. Um, you can teach singing. Could you teach? Someone to become a Benny Friedman, or it's has to, it's very organic. It's I, I think it's impossible because and not just a Benny Friedman. I mean, it's a weird thing to say, but a person is is made up of a billion details, right? So I can I can teach you one thing that I know, but I can't teach you a billion things that are, that uh, that make up. Who I, I mean, am. if someone sings off tune, I mean, you can't teach them, right? They're sort of stuck. You probably could, if you, you have enough patience. Um, there's probably very few people who are like legit tone deaf. Uh, most of it is just a, like a lack of understanding or a lack of effort or interest. Most people are not actually tone deaf. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, everybody can become better at, at whatever they want to become better at if they're interested. Do you think? Performers have to be connected to their fans now that people expect it on social media that they know their celebrities in a more deeper, organic way. Or it's you could still be the Avon Fried and Mark David, known like 
it, there's a certain, I believe, a, that I think the Avonfried MBD era is very distant. There are big celebrities, and we get a little, you know, we get starstruck versus the Benny Friedman, Mordechai Shapiro stars that people know them. They know what they're there. So they go shopping. There's a certain human connection that, that, that never existed before. Do you think there's a huge shift and expectations from fans that they need to know their stars in a more personal way? Or not? Probably. I mean, today uh, is a very social media heavy time. But look, everybody... When I say social media, I mean getting to know the people better. That's Social media is just a tool. It's Social media created that expectation, maybe. It could or allowed the expectation. It allowed the possibility. Um, and, and some people take advantage of it very, very well. And some people, it's not for them. You know what I mean? Some people, uh, maybe if people got to know them better on social media, they would like them less. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have to know who you are. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Every person is different. Everybody's going to going to reach their 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 end goals in a different way. Today, with albums not really being the money maker, where is the money? Is it weddings? Oh, nobody knows because uh, Corona <laughs> destroyed also the live gigs. So now there's no uh, no 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 CD sales. Is CD no sales concerts. considered revenue or considered a free sample, like a promotional thing? Well, it depends. I mean, has it got a little better with? It's gotten a little bit better with streaming and with downloads. Uh, a little bit better, not great. And it keeps getting, it's you know the situation keeps deteriorating. So is it weddings? It's yet yeah. weddings. Yeah, big weddings. Is the many weddings? Many. So singers they have so to I've work harder this. to make the same money that they used to. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Or not even the same money that they used to. You know, less. Work harder, make less. But it's fine. Look, uh, you, you're a singer. Not to you don't, nobody says let me be a singer and I'll be rich. That's not how. That's not how it is. Anymore. Have you considered partnering with businesses or doing sponsorship deals, or not so much? Like what? Like uh, vitamins? About Geico? Or like being on the uh, ad for I don't know, Zaylor vitamins? Or uh, is that a thing for Jew? I mean, in the secular yeah. world, it's a very big thing. Yeah, the, the endorsements, world, yeah. like a basketball player, makes more money endorsements than he gets from his salary. You mean you ever? It could be because you have, they have more influence. I don't know. I don't know if anybody is going to be like. I mean, I don't know. The truth is, I don't. I never, Uncle Moshi does it. Yeah, Uncle Moshi does with it. vitamins Moshi and has pizza. Huge influence over millions of children. Perhaps you're undervaluing and uh, your influence. Is that, is that potential? It is possible. Okay, if I may say. You, you you may say that it's possible, or are you saying that that's what's I'm happening? I'm saying that's what's happening. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> I have no idea. No, nobody's ever uh, approached, approached me about it. Uh, Perhaps you need to get a new agent. A new agent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, question: If I think, uh, is there a way to ask KMR to please take care of these mosquitoes? I mean, <laughs> KMR is a high, a high uh, level program over here, but the mosquitoes, my goodness! If you had to tell Benny Friedman something today, when he was twelve years old, when he was singing, what would you tell that Benny Friedman in terms of chizuk or something? He, you learned over the past 20 years to, and really to any aspiring 12 year old, 15 year old singer, what would you tell him, things that they should know or things, steps they should take to put themselves put themselves out there, whatever, what, what would you say the tips are? The things you do's and don'ts, but more of the do's. Sing, sing a lot. Publicly. Sing everywhere, yeah. Any stage that you can get on, that's somewhat decent, get on there. Sing a lot smile a lot and drink a lot of water and uh, try as best you can to be uh, uh, real people feel the authenticity more than ever I don't know about more than ever I wasn't around uh, with social media you know, you're more exposed more vulnerable people yeah. can't, games is you know, one Google people search. have a lot of options you know what I mean a lot of options so, so you tell a young guy, seeing as much as possible in public as much as possible, and see what happens. Yeah, for sure. Because if you have it organically, it will. People will come back and say, "Hey, could you sing?" If you, I mean, is that how it started with you? What was the first time you charged, Benny? Yeah. What was the first time you charged, and how much did you charge? The first time I charged, I think it was when I when I uh, broke out Color War for Camp Romamu as Avram Freed. I think I got one hundred and fifty dollars for that. Was it hard to Good have money. a? 
Was it difficult to make that first step and say, I want money? They offered it. Oh, so you didn't have to ask? You didn't have to ask for it. Wow, oh, so you're lucky. Yeah. No, I, 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 that's what I mean to say is everybody's story is going to be different. I, I find that for business people, talented people, the hardest thing is that first time they ask money. They're like, should I, should I not? Should I do? Maybe they won't pay. They do. They do. Five till, million till doubts. Till today, it's the hardest part. It's still. Till today. Oh. T- today, that is this. Today, that's the hardest part. Of knowing your value or asking for your value. Yeah. Wow. So it hasn't gotten any easier. Especially when you deal with like tough, a tough customer on the other side who is much better at this game than you are. Oh my gosh, it's like it's like a pinata, you know, boom, 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 and all the candy comes right out. But the, isn't there a supply demand element that will put you in the right place? Yeah. Like if it, you get you, you ten calls for one night, you know, okay, yeah. it's time to raise the prices. Yeah, yeah. in Indian, in Indian, you're right. The, the market should sort of correct Indian, itself. Right. The way it works is you go, okay, fine, I'll do it. And then two minutes later, you get a phone call for that same night. You go, oh, man. Oh, man. Anyway, I, whatever. It's all good. Well, that's, that's it. Okay. okay. That, that helps you keep, that, that really keeps you sane. Even, you know what I mean? Even, uh, even if you don't believe it. If you weren't. Believe it. If you weren't a singer, what would you do, Benny? Oof, I would be very, very, be very broke. I tried. Think? I've tried in the past, to, uh, you know, to have other jobs. Like, I think I worked for Kibbutz for like two days. Doing what? I don't even remember. I, I actually I was translating from Hebrew into English, um, not for Kibbutz. This is a different job that I had. For uh, somebody would write every week a speech. A rabbi he would write. He would write a sermon, and he wanted to to give to be able to give it out or sell it or whatever he wanted to translate it into English. And he needed, he would send it to me on Monday, he needed it ready for Wednesday. I think I did one. The following week, I couldn't, I couldn't meet the deadline. It was... Being a famous person like yourself, is it, how do you deal with the crowd and the public? Do they expect you to be always nice and always smile? Is there, do you feel that expectation? So, let, let me just say one second. I'm not, I'm not a famous guy. I'm famous in certain, like on certain blocks in Brooklyn... I'm very famous. You know what I mean? If I walk... Lakewood? In, yeah. Muncie? Jerusalem. Okay. Jerusalem. Your neighbor? Um, uh, Tel Aviv? No. Manhattan? No. Minnesota? No. So, you know, if, if, I, if, it's, if it ever gets overwhelming, I just got to go walk to another block and suddenly it's not overwhelming anymore. There are people who are famous, who are famous famous. I'll give you an example. I remember I was davening for the Elmet in California. And uh, on your kipper, and suddenly, like the, the side door in the corner opens up, and a guy with a hoodie and a talus pulled over, like shuffles in, and you know, sidesteps his way to his seat and sits down. And he keeps pulling his talus over his head, and uh, and you know, and finally they blow the shafer by Neila, and he jumps up and runs out, like he has to get out before the crowd starts moving. This at Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan has nowhere on the planet to go. Where he's, he's, he's not he's not going to be bombarded with people. That guy's famous. That guy's life is 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 defined by his fame. Hi, Hashem. You know. You're not famous enough. I I am plenty. I'm plenty. Uh, I'm I'm anonymous enough to have a normal life. Yeah. If I want to go into a, a popular kosher restaurant, I'll have to uh, take some picture with some people. But like I always say. In my business, the alternative would be way worse, right? If you walk into a room and nobody knows you and nobody wants to take a picture with you and nobody looks your way, that would be much worse. So, so it's just part of the package. Yeah. You should look at it as part of the package. Sure. I'm assuming it's, in general, it's easier for certain people than others, right? Like a Mordechai Shapiro personality, probably a little easier. For sure. Avon Freed personality, a little harder. Yeah. You know, he's more reserved. Benny Friedman, somewhere in the middle. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> but. Yeah, for sure. No do people ask you ever that question? Or am I the first one to ask you that? Everybody asks. Oh, they do? Yeah. Uh, Hopefully what, it'll be the last one. Of uh, what people expect. Yeah, how is it? Do you, uh, people, they want to talk to you and take a picture. And this, is, it a, is it overwhelming? So it's good that you're on the more reserved side. It's, you have less issues, you know? 
less issues. Less issues in this department because the conversation lasts about four right, seconds. It's very short. <laughs> just yeah. People go, oh my gosh, it's Ben, and then I go talk to him. And then they talk to me and they're like, oh, you're actually quite boring. <laughs> um, how do I get out of this conversation? I don't even know why I started this. Where, uh, oh, I have to go, sorry. What's interesting about interviewing you, Benny, is that you, you're in music and you're also intellectual. You know, you, that's your background, I mean, your background. Your family, your rabbi is in. So when doing interviews with you, it's not just, what about this song you're going to be singing in 2002 and this wedding? No, it's a, more, it's a wholesome, interesting, intellectual, psycholo- whatever the word is, type of interviews, not just, sure. you know. Okay, I think I ran out of questions. See right? that? You yeah. are among the many of hey, people I who discovered <laughs> that it's like, oh gosh, how do I get out of this conversation? 26 minutes. Oof, 26 minutes? Yeah. Oh my goodness, I gotta go home. One last thing. I I, met, I spoke to you off camera, but now we have a camera rolling. Let's ask again, because I think it's interesting. Do you usually know when which song in the album is a hit song? I think you know it at the end of the process, right? I think you can go into a song thinking this song is going to work, and then by the time it's done, you know that eh, it's actually not this song; it's actually a different song. Like you, you. I mean, in my experience, I've had experiences where I thought a certain song was going to go, and then by the time the CD was ready, it was obvious that this other song is much stronger. Um, could it have been that I pushed, produced the other song wrong? It's possible. But uh, you, usually you know, not at the beginning of the process, but at the end of the process. What percent of the song being popular is the way the arrangements, or just the actual raw song, just has the hook, has the, the catchiness? They're both extremely 10, 20 percent? I mean, what would yeah. you put a number on? No idea. I would maybe say, yeah, 65, 35. Okay. You know Which I mean? means to say that if you don't have a big budget, you could still make a very big hit song. Because sixty five percent is the song. It doesn't need to be yeah. a whole five trillion but, but dollar look, production. But, but a, a wrong, a wrong arrangement, a wrong production can can destroy a good song. What do you think about the Chabadska Nigun? I guess that's what they call it. The way it took off because it was twisted a little. Yeah. And it became re, whatever the word is. In that case, you're right. Because of a little, the arrangement was. I don't know if the word is arrangement or recomposition. What would be the right? Um, they, yeah, they, they ch- changed the whole the whole uh, vibe of the song, which is great. Um, and I'll give you another example of that. Avram Fried um, recorded. Hey, tzama, 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 and then I think Lipa Schmelzer maybe re- uh, didn't even record it. I think he sang it live once in a, like a disco. Hey, tzama, tzama, tzama. and suddenly. Phew, the whole thing exploded, and somehow it's like one of the biggest, most popular Chabad songs today. Um, and like, uh, the Rebbe really taught it slow, slowish. You mean Sama? Yeah, hey, hey, hey right. Sama. But I would say the Chabad Skanigan was very unpopular, and it became yeah. super popular. Yeah, yeah. I remember from some Hichel Menachem tape they gave out one of their, back in the days of, you know, when they had a lot of funds, they would put out stuff all day long, and they put out that song. And it was like a dead stale song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with the little, I I don't know who gets no the question. credit. I yeah. think the guy in Israel, and I forgot who said who gets the credit for doing the remix. Was it or? I, I, I heard, who's the, who one that actually published it was Barry, Barry Weber. Weber. But I think he told me, I don't know, yeah. you, you're at bigger risk to say something like this than me. That he said he heard that version from maybe what's a Lubavitcher in Israel who sings his guitar with like oh. anyway, I heard he heard it from him and that's what we heard it. and then he ran with it. I don't know. Yeah, your colleague. Yes, I think that's what he said. Could be, could be. Mordechai ben David did that with one of with uh, one of the new that uh, Yair your uh, guitarized. He sings. Uh, when you, you say, know, you know it as Ha'inanam, 
But that didn't really take off as much as the other two ones we're talking about. But you see, with the right different arrangement, it becomes a whole. Yeah, for sure. I know other people tried after to other do other nagrim to re, and it didn't was not as successful as. I, what are they called? The Chabatsk Nagrim? What's the official? Today it's called the Chabatsk Nagrim. Is, 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 is it still requested at weddings or no? Oh, yeah. Still. Oh, yeah. So there's a timeless element. Oh, yeah. Talking of timeless elements. This it, interview. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it that I see it, it appears that certain songs come and go, and it seems by Nagunim have a certain timeless effect? And I would say Shlomo Kabach also. And they, you know, I, I say that the song of Test of Time is if they're singing it, comes it says 10, 20 years later. Do you agree, believe, do you agree or believe with that statement or not? Um, I think I would agree with that, but also there's a difference. There are songs that people sing today that they didn't sing five years ago, but it, may, it came back. There are songs that never left. Shlomo Karlbach songs never went anywhere. They came out, and people sang them, and people continued to sing them for the last 30 years. There are songs that people sang 30 years ago that disappeared for 20 years, and it came back. And it's a little bit different. What's the difference? Basically, but there's a difference there. Um, I think the Rebbe said once about uh, what's, a, what's the pshat a gishmak and nigan is a gishmak and nigan is a nigan that you don't get sick of. You can sing it again and again, you don't get sick of. Interesting. What's the, re- what's the recipe for that? What's the secret on that? I knew. Oh. Great. Thank you very much, Benny, for this great interview. And uh, hopefully, whoever is watching will. Take some lessons, but I, tr- I I was trying to get it from a business startup perspective. You know, how could someone do it? The difficult parts, the you know, that's what was my Just agenda. Have to be able to take a, a long punishment. You know what I mean? You have to be able to uh, to suffer for, for something that you like. If you if you want it, like I said, if you have no choice, right? If it's in your blood, if it's in your kishkits, if it's in your neshama, if you have no choice, you just do it. And that will translate to more success as well. Yeah. One more thing. I'm sorry. If you're not a wedding style type of singer, let's say you're a Zusha or Melech Cohen, and if all the revenue is coming from weddings, it's even the starving artist element is even more real for them than you. Sure. No question, because you're talking about a, a niche market, Lechatchila, right? It's a very small market, Jewish. So you really have to, the, love, the labor of love. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. It's true. You're talking about a niche because no one's really hiring Zusha, Mel Cohen, who, who, or that and, and genre. You happen to be mentioning like the most successful of Correct. that genre. Correct. You have guys who do that who nobody even knows about. And they do it because they love it. They have no choice. 